those of you here today are responsible for advising and leading and, and guiding. Spending on cybersecurity is expected to top $100 billion in 2015, with a forecast annual growth rate of over 20% over the next five years. And this, together with the threat of cyber attacks to corporate performance, I believe warrants our companies and our industry's attention. This, uh, this next section, session will be hosted by Carlos Barrera, our moderator. We were very fortunate to have Carlos with us from Switzerland and London. Uh, where he delivered a, uh, an, an enlightening uh, address that was uh, both terrifying um, and, uh, and I think encouraging uh, in so much as that there are solutions that organizations like Carlos's are developing and bringing to the market today and I know that will be very much uh, a, a part of this conversation. So I'd like you to please join me in welcoming Carlos Morera, the CEO of WiseKey. <laughs> And, uh, and an esteemed panel, which Carlos, I will let you introduce. Thank you very much, David. It is a pleasure for me to be here. We just uh, did a similar panel in London, in Bloomberg, about cybersecurity. I am from a country which, uh, as you can imagine, has huge concern about cybersecurity because it's a country which is a financial hub. And just to give you an, an image, which is the image I would like to open the panel, in Switzerland we are already voting, uh, means election, through a mobile phone. So that means that there is a threat, but it's a huge amount of opportunities as well if we know how to mitigate those threats. So I have the pleasure to have a very interesting panel and at the same time very uh, different panel because we have among ourselves experts on cybersecurity, financial experts as well, and they have relations to the cybersecurity. So I have uh, a pleasure just on order to introduce Jeff Jeffrey Wells, Executive Director of the Cybersecurity Development in Maryland Department of Business and Economic Development. Jeffrey will give us insights from uh, Maryland and, and how to build cybersecurity hubs, and which are the opportunities around states uh, to involve and invest in cybersecurity. Then we have uh, Mario Robello. Mario Robello is an old friend of, of me. We have been working together with Microsoft in the past on where Mario was leading the uh, public sector division and very much involved in everything which relates to cybersecurity around the world, and in particular now in advising the U.S. government on cybersecurity. Then uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Gregory uh, Sohaja, which is the president of the McKinnock Partners Business Intelligence Division and manage the company service capability for corporate due diligence investigation on cybersecurity and business intelligence. He will also give us insight about this huge market growing around us, which is the investigation and intelligence market. And then lastly with uh, Gregory Bedrosian, also a, a good old friend. Gregory is very active into the uh, uh, investment uh, world in Europe and also in the United States. And uh, he will give us some insights about the cybersecurity M&As and where we stand in terms of uh, the opportunities around cybersecurity. So maybe just to start, and I'm going to do that in a Q&A as we do in Davos in the World Economic Forum. By the way, uh, this panel will continue in Davos in January as we are continue. Uh, reflecting our visions and thought leadership on cybersecurity. Maybe just to start first with Mario. Mario, as we are in the United States, what is, what is the position of the Congress and what concerns cybersecurity? Are we taking serious cybersecurity now versus what happened maybe in the past? Thank you, Carlos. It's, the issue is real, as we've just heard the statistics, and it's being discussed in real manner, real time. However, the political parties in Washington, both in the Congress, and the administration are having just a difficult time agreeing on a baseline in a, and on a cybersecurity framework. A number of congressional leaders are looking to make it voluntary. Others want to make it mandatory. The administration has come out and, ha and has proposed a, an excellent cybersecurity framework that's voluntary in nature. But again, it's getting consensus. Everybody, there's a lot of talk about cybersecurity. And actually, Jeff and I participated at uh, National Governor's uh, Task Force with uh, the governors from Maryland and Michigan. And actually, the governors were able to get something done because they, both parties were at the table and they put politics aside on this issue at the state level and actually worked on it and were able to form a, uh, a coalition. That's great. Whereas in Congress, it's much more difficult to find that coalition, even within a party. So there's very wide views. So we're hopeful that we will see some action very soon. There is a need for legislative action. I will um, applaud the administration for taking positive steps, but at the same time, we in the industry do need clarity 
in the legislation. For example, the number one issue that would help us collectively is the sharing of information on vulnerabilities and risks. Companies are afraid to come forward and share that information because it will be held against them. But yet, the breaches continue. So from that perspective alone, establishing a safe harbor uh, pr provision, as well as allowing and encouraging information to be shared amongst the parties, having corporate sectors and corporate leaders in IT come forward and say, these are the threats that we're seeing coming in, would help agencies and law enforcement address the issue. But there's just um, a hostility at times of working together right now in Washington on a number of these issues. From our observation in my company, and we are uh, helping several governments on cybersecurity, one of the threats that we are realizing now is that the password is dead. I mean, we're still using password. Password was a notion even before the internet. We have been using password for nearly 30 years now. And the password technology is totally obsolete. And everything runs in passwords. I mean, you are all using passwords to access your mobile phones, to access your email, to access your websites. And passwords are totally unprotected. So, so in the United States, you're going to have something that in Europeans we studied, maybe because we studied with the chip technology many years ago. You, you're going to have something we call the National Infrastructure on Trusted Identity in Cyberspace, which is a strategy for the White House to protect citizens in the United States. What is your views? Because I, I really believe cybersecurity ground zero is protecting first the citizens. Corporations have different ways to protect themselves. But citizens is essential because citizens are being hacked every day. 18 million Americans lost their personal data last year. And this is incremental. So how are we protecting citizens from the US government perspective? Today, we're really not. I mean, we are, all of us in this room, we're the low-hanging fruit for the hackers. You know, we're all, we're all tapping our, our smartphone, our, our device. We're clicking on links. We're clicking on emails that we think we know who they're from. But in reality, it's, it's, it's from a hacker or others. So the issue is, today we're not focused on the consumer and the end user as much as we are trying to protect the data and the networks. And I think that there's an opportunity for the US to learn from the European side. Um, and in fact, uh, coming up at the end of the month, there is a joint session of NIST and Department of Homeland Security taking a, a delegation to Europe and Brussels and learning about the NIS and how to apply those lessons and those technologies that have been developed uh, elsewhere in Europe and bringing them back to the US. So there's hope, but it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, but yet the hackers are hacking us daily. I mean, they're three, four steps ahead of us, but the opportunity is for us to educate the consumers and really apply a new standard, a new framework of how do we protect individual uh, privacy as well as ind individual identities. Thank you. Uh, and Jeffrey, Maryland has been, uh, anyways, that's the perception we get from outside, maybe from films. Uh, it's the hub of cybersecurity of the United States, together maybe with uh, Salt Lake, uh, which also is very big now on cybersecurity and in particular cloud technology. Is, is, is cybersecurity a major economic growth um, for a, a state? Is it states can create jobs, can create startups around cybersecurity? And if they do, what is the strategy in Maryland? Sure. Uh, you know, the state of Maryland certainly is, is um, considered the epicenter for cybersecurity, mostly because of the, uh, the strong presence with NSA, Cyber Command, NIST, and the other agencies that are there. Um, I think it's important to think you know, cybersecurity is really a cool word, yeah. um, but what does it mean? And I think that there's a lot of talk about it, but I think it's, you know, it's really about ones and zeros. It's about the user. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, focusing on the technology is a quick way to make money, but it's not about solving the problem. And so I think that um, one of the things that you know, we have um, going on in Maryland is that this tight geography of both um, customers as well as education institutions as well as um, a startup community and uh, this evolution from the past where it was very heavily focused on services and addressing the customer, um, US government as a customer, to really approaching uh, various sectors and saying, what are the problems that sectors have? What can we d use um, from what we know in the past and apply those to developing new companies with products, um, whether those be software or hardware products, to address very specific customer needs. And I think that's the most uh, um, opportunity. It's a wonderful um, business model. 
I wish I had come up with it uh, you know, as a hacker. Um, I love it, but uh, you know, is that it's never going to go away. Yeah. This problem is never going to go away. Every single person in this room, every network, every piece of data that you have is already corrupted. Yeah. That's important to know. And I think that from a business model perspective, either whether you're trying to think about investments or just solving your own internal issue, yeah. is to realize we've already been invaded. Now, how are you going to handle that problem? Especially if you project that over the next 10 years. I mean, by the year 2020, we're going to have 50 billion devices connected to the internet. I was with the World Economic Forum in a meeting with Chancellor Merkel in, in Germany, where the vision was that, for instance, car companies are not anymore a car company. They are a software company making cars. Mm -hmm. so, so now the, the shift is towards those companies to become platforms, knowledge, knowledge platforms and being able to secure their products because, I mean, hacking a phone is fine, but imagine hacking your car in the future or hacking your house or hacking your power grid or hacking your nuclear stations. I mean, the Internet of Things is coming, is there already. And the same things apply to cybersecurity and personal data applies also on Internet of Things. So it's a huge possibility for the United States to be a leader on that. Sure, and it's an incredible opportunity for business growth. I mean, this Internet, uh, and I call it the data of things, is a great opportunity to increase efficiency, uh, to really um, grow your business, and to, um, and to address real problems. But on the flip side, it, 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 there are an insurmountable amount of issues that are out there, and you can't address every single risk in, a, in, in cybersecurity um, on a daily basis. It's just the volume is too much. But it really is about hedging and, and, and identifying what are the risks and what are the ways that you're going to um, spread that across your portfolio to say we're going to address this as from a risk perspective rather than from a defensive perspective. So Greg, first Greg, as we have two Gregs. <laughs> Just on your experience, one of the things we are realizing also, and in the advice work my company does, but also at Davos, is that when, when we approach company on cybersecurity about a few years ago, if we talk at CEO or board, at board level on cybersecurity, they say, look, this is not my problem. Talk to the IT guy, and, and he will talk to you. Obviously, the IT guy was only looking at the technology. Now, with the new threats on, on Target losing their valuation, Home Depot, a few weeks ago, GP Morgan, and this is going to be re recurrent in the, in, the, in the month ahead, CEOs are getting concerned that the cybersecurity is not a concern of the uh, chief security officer, but is his concern, as, as is basically the entire company valuation can be, can be whipped up by just having a, a bad communication issue on cybersecurity. Now, how you help companies from your investigative work? I mean, what is the process? If I am a CEO of a company, uh, and I really want to know if I am protected, and I call on you, what, what I should ask you and what you should be helping me in? Yeah, that, that's a broad question, but a, a very good one, certainly. And this is the old corporate espionage, now cyber threats. It's you know, taken on a new name, and you can do it from 1,000 miles away and get proprietary information or employee information and, and so many different things, the way you can infiltrate a company. Is it still involve an insider? Yeah, the probability of that happening is still high, that there's somebody inside who's helping or making the, the, uh, the process easier. But a CEO has got to know that it's a, it's a team effort. It's not just IT. It's not just the hierarchy of the company. There are so many different ways to do it. There is still a, a simple physical aspect to it. Um, and it's all about lowering the probability of falling victim. Um, but your reputation is on the line. Um, certainly the proprietary information you're protecting um, is a big, a big concern. And now these executives traveling so much and taking their laptops and their zip drives and, and everything else with them, it's got to be looked at uh, as part of the whole picture. You can't just narrow it down to an executive or the C-level or IT. Uh, so you go in there, try to get your arm around everything and, and narrow it down the best you can. But don't you, don't you realize also, uh, maybe it's my observation outside the United States, that it, it, the corporation thing in cybersecurity as a fortress, meaning the bad people are outside, inside we're all good people, and, and therefore if we buy a lot of uh, technology to pr protect the perimeter, we are safe. But 99% of the latest cybersecurity threats happen inside. Right. Happens because we bring a mobile phone, which is unprotected. Happens because we are not able to segregate personal data with the corporate data. How do you protect or how do you advise companies to protect against those threats? I mean, the foundation for that is a, a very solid uh, set of policies and procedures to start. Um, but, you know, it carries on from there. It works in a, a layered system, a, 
you know, having a policy for a terminated employee, a disgruntled employee. All these simple things now uh, hold a lot of weight and can cause a lot of damage. So um, it might not just be uh, a cyber threat uh, at, after information. It might be sabotage or other issues that can cause a, a, a great amount of damage. Yeah. So, But I think you, you touched on something really important, that it, this is not a technology problem. Technology is the tool, but it's just, it, everything in cybersecurity is a people problem, whether it's bad design, whether there's a bad actor somewhere trying to do something, or uh, internally, it, it all comes down to the people. And so it's not just the CISO's problem. It's not the CSO or the CTO. This is a, a, an entire company's issue and it, or an entire ecosystem's issue is that it comes down to the people and yeah. how are you going to address not just their disgruntled, but how are you going to train them to be aware that you know, bringing in um, your device into the enterprise it is, is going to cause problems. And if you make it difficult, we all know, people are going to figure out a way to get around it. So it's, if, you know, your passwords are complex, people will tape them to their keyboard. So it's... But, but, but the technology is there. When you work in good technology, good has this technology yeah. to allow your, your, bring your mobile phone inside, which is totally protected. So why are not we using it? Why are not investing? Why corporations don't buy this technology faster? At times, it's just uh, they have so many priorities. And in the past, this hasn't been a big problem. But ask Target, ask Home Depot, ask any company that's been uh, hacked. It's a major problem now that's now reached the board level. The CEO and the board members are liable. Sure. And sure. many of them have started to lose their jobs over this issue. Sure. But in the past, there were so many priorities that they said, oh, the IT guy will, will mm -hmm. take care of this. Yeah. We'll put a firewall yeah. and we're safe. We're not. Yeah. I mean, we ourselves, are the largest uh, amount of, uh, we got the low hanging fruit. Yeah. I mean, hackers look for all of us and that's their way in. Whether it's a personal device or a corporate device, it's how you manage your data, how you protect the data. The devices at times is irrelevant. It's the data and well, the network. And the network is irrelevant. Yeah. Correct. Well, well uh, just to, if, I, if I could, Carlos, just to interject as it relates to what, what our firm, Redwood, is predominantly involved in, which is the merger and acquisition and corporate finance and private equity world, to echo some of the comments made here, we're seeing more and more uh, boards elevate that security role to um, either the CEO, sometimes an independent chairman who may have some expertise, and importantly, in M&A processes of, of, of a company within any sector, um, especially large cap acquirers are adding that type of cybersecurity diligence to their closing checklists in addition to financials, in addition to calling vendors and customers. They're adding an element of that because what they don't want to do is be in a situation where it's been ignored or underinvested in for years then they acquire the business and inherit a lot of those issues. So it's, it's come to the fore um, as it relates to the value of businesses. And unfortunately, some of the high profile cases um, you know, that, that are all across the news, it's unfortunate for those businesses and those CEOs and boards, but the, the silver lining is it's created awareness at a much higher level, even with mid-sized players to, to focus on that more as it relates to value building. But Gregory, are, are we investing in enough on cyber security? I mean, when we are talking about the, the massive revenue generation possibility of cyber security market, the fact that we are reaching 180 billion by the year 2018, yeah. why are we not investing? I mean, if you really look at the number of companies on cyber security, you still have RSA, Symantec, those are 20 years, 15 years old right. company. With exception of FireEye that just entered the market about a year ago, there's nothing else. Why are we not investing more in cyber security? It's a, it's a great question. I, I think if one looks at the, if one looks at the statistics over the last couple of years um, of investment in those businesses, most of them are actually very early stage startups. Um, we actually looked at some of the data and, and over the last kind of 12 to 18 months, over 60% of the capital deployed into cybersecurity related companies were in either seed or A round investing. So what that's telling us is, and this is of a several billion dollar Private, private equity and venture capital commitment. So what that's saying is there are a whole generation of younger startups that are addressing you know, some of these new emerging needs, but they're at a very early stage. And you know, the positive side is as well that the types of investors that are focused on this are some of the world's leading 
venture and private equity groups. If you look at, you know, again, in the last 12 to 18 months, the, the top investors in cybersecurity um, early stage companies are literally, you know, Intel, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia, Excel, Andreessen Horowitz. So the, the, the smart and the, the, the high IQ investors, the cream of the crop of Silicon Valley and, 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 and that related ilk are investing, but they're targeting young, smaller players. And what that, what that could mean, Carlos, is over time, um, a consolidation play where some of the you know, larger or more mid-sized public or private groups get critical mass and are able to bring in some of those capabilities from some of those hot prospects of some of those high quality yeah. venture backed companies. I think the consolidation is a critical point on cyber security because my experience is that, for instance, if you try and, you know, when I am private company and trying to sell to uh, top 500 firms my technology, the first question they ask me, when are you going to be public? Because you, I don't trust you being a private company on cyber security because they're giving to you critical assets to protect. So, so the problem is that you're only going to be a public company after a certain time. So what happens between that moment and the time I, I become a public company? So I guess consolidation is a solution, but another solution is also to educate VCs that cybersecurity is not like social media, that you can create a fuss about it and just collect money. I mean, cybersecurity is a long-term process that requires first a company to go through the process on building trust, because it's all what it's all about, right? Trust. Yep. So, yeah, go ahead. And that's, ex and that's expensive, you know, and that's expensive. In both in time and resources. But I would say is, you know, in Maryland and uh, their general uh, region around that area, we've seen in the last 24 months a large number of ex-government employees, so NSA, PhDs, uh, ex-military, um, who've gone to create these new companies, many of which are getting uh, invested by those organizations. But the, 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 one of the challenges, I think, again, is um, it's educating the customer base as to what the problem is that they have. But there is no silver bullet, and I think there, that's one of the problems that most you know, C-level suites have, is they think, I'm just going to call my IT department. They have a, they'll put a box in, and that solves all my problems. But there are more problems out there than I can name today. And to, you know, it's, it's finding those particular problems that are the pain points that are presenting the most risk to your organization, and then investing in those. Because there's so much money, and many companies have invested into these legacy systems and trying to, to add new products and services on top of those legacy systems is a challenge because it costs, it takes money. And I heard somebody uh, at a conference two weeks ago say, now you should be spending 20% 20, 20 of what you have to lose yep. on cybersecurity. Yep. That's, that's a big number. Yep. And that's hard for most people to swallow, yep. especially. And Greg, one, one, one also uh, important question from your experience working on federal uh, agencies is now we are also talking now about something completely new, which is coming, which is not even anymore cyber security, cyber war. I mean, there had been already some cases on cyber war. The Arenco oil got uh, attacked through a cyber war uh, activity. Uh, Estonia, the entire country, got shut down by Russians at the time through a cyber war activity. This is going to be recurrent. Uh, somebody are saying the next world war, worldwide war will not be on the on the tankers and planes; will be through the internet. So, so what is what is your views about? Are we protecting America against a cyber war? Is, is, is are, are we not scared this will happen? Because it will happen. Countries are getting ready for that. What is the intelligence that you can collect at national level to help? the government and the country to fight against that. I agree. Uh, on the terrorism front, uh, it's a, a whole different angle. Um, and you're, it, again, it, why send troops in when you can do damage from you know, behind a computer screen? Um, so it, it's a grave concern. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the, uh, the agencies within the government are building up. Um, uh, how much, how, what's the percentage of new agents within the NSA, the agency, and different other smaller agencies that are helping to, to combat this. So they're hiring these executives to try to, try to fight and battle this. So it, it's, it's incredibly challenging, incredibly difficult, and still relatively new. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to take time. But they're the same people. The same people that they are behind cybersecurity, they become the same people after cyber war. I mean, you, you, on the illicit trade, you know, my company is helping brands to protect yeah. their products. It's $1 trillion economy. 5% of the global trade, now it goes to illicit trade. That money funds the mafias of the world. They become later cyber security commands and cyber war commands. So, so everything is related. Everything is connected. Yeah, and some of these companies, they, they fully 
they already know they're going to be fall victim to this, so they build it into their budget that it, we know it's going to be a problem for us instead of trying to solve it. Um, you know, they could put some of that money into a different different pot and maybe change all that. So, but one of the challenges that that is faced, and especially is you know, what is cyber war? How do you define it? Cyber command, you know, that's on a daily basis, they're trying to address that. But also it goes back to the sharing of information. So yeah, the, there's great value in cybersecurity, the big site C cybersecurity, to share information. But there are laws and issues out there that are pre you know, preventing organizations and the US government from sharing that information back and forth. Sure. So that, you know, it's just, it's kind of a very, it is depressing. because. Yeah, you know, but, but, but there the is world, no out. The world needs need leaderships, and the world needs the United States to be the leader. I mean, uh, we know from Europe, I mean, Europe is totally fragmented. You go to France, and you have Dassault, you go to Spain, you have Indra, you have uh, German companies, they don't talk to each other, so it's, it's a mess. And, and, and it's going to be maybe a 10 to 20 years time before Europeans will act together. The United States is the leader on cybersecurity. You have the biggest company, you have the biggest budget, but you have a major issue now, which is trust the trust issue. Snowden has created a lot of damage on trust. How can you solve trust? And what, what is your view, Mario, on, on how to rebuild the confidence in America towards our security? This is where innovation in startups and the whole uh, tech economy has the opportunity to address that, that trust issue. Look, trust is not going to be resolved anytime soon. The US government or even US corporations, they're having a difficult time operating in Europe, as an example. Europeans don't want to deal with American companies of, of the Snowden. So, but if you, were to, if you were to introduce a joint venture where a number of tech startups, whether they're from Maryland or whether from the Valley or, other, or here, even here in New York City, a lot of talent is here, encouraging the collaboration with European colleagues or Asian colleagues or colleagues in Brazil. So these are hot spots that are looking at this issue, but nobody's talking, nobody's sharing information, nobody's sharing the innovation. So everybody's in their little corner doing their thing. And what we need to do as business leaders, as political leaders, think tanks or you know, influential groups, we need to bring these stakeholders together yeah. and really address the trust issue by allowing them to work together around innovating that innovation that is simple and secure and I think that's how we overcome the trust issue. Yeah. We're also talking about a business that doesn't trust anything. Correct. Yeah. And so you're asking a business that doesn't trust anything to create trust across organizations. And I think you know, there's a lot of competition in this space that, doesn't, that is, isn't necessary. That it's really co-opetition is, is the real opportunity. And I think it, there are no borders. No. And I think that you know, um, waiting for the government to make the decision, I think, is, is it's a waste of is, time. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work in this country anyway. And so it's it's for the entrepreneurs and for the established yeah. businesses to drive, and it's for industries like banking or finance, uh, for healthcare to start making yeah. those decisions on their own, well in advance of because. Nothing's going to happen in the next five years. Yeah. And I guess financial institutions as well. I mean, J.P. Morgan got hacked. This is now personal data of their own consumers now being, being available to hackers. And the position of the company was, we're going to invest something like $300 million on cybersecurity. I mean, come on. You know, you've been hacked. I mean, my data in J.P. Morgan has been transferred to a person I don't know. Uh, maybe the leadership should come in also for the financial sector because at the end of the day, you trust your bank, right? I trust my bank to have my money, so I should trust my bank to also to protect my data. This is an asset. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's a great point, and, I, and I, especially the large, many of, many of whom are headquartered here in New York City, many of the large financial institutions, um, as CEOs and boards start realizing, as you're pointing out, Carlos, to take a leadership role, um, in, in that trust. Now that's a big leap for them because they need to have self-confidence that they've got the plan in place. But I, I know from experience with, as it relates to the JP Morgan situation, um, the, the amount of men and women hours that were required by all the mid-level and junior people and account managers to outreach to their customers was enormous. The flip side is that's a great opportunity actually for an institution like JP Morgan to turn that into a positive um, way in terms of touching thousands and tens of thousands of consumers, um, you know, uh, across the country and across the world. Um, and it would be great if many of the, the, the CEOs of the large 
money center and, and bulge bracket firms here in New York City did so, use that as a leadership so, opportunity. So I give you two scenarios, a positive one and a negative one. A positive one is that financial institutions, government, especially governments like the United States government, takes leadership on cybersecurity, create trust, and consolidate this ecosystem, which is totally fractionated, into a global offering. And, and then we create something solid for the future. The, the, uh, the negative system is that if we continue making mistakes, the internet is going to disappear. China is announcing their own internet. Russians are doing the same. Brazil president is saying, now we don't want to join the internet anymore. We want our data to be located in our country because there's a lack of trust. If the internet fractions, then it's not internet anymore. Those are fractioning nets that will not talk to each other, where companies will suffer the consequences of having a very reduced communication tool. So I think we should focus on the uh, positive scenario because we are nearly there, but needs international cooperation. Maybe I open the floor to questions to the panel uh, on the subject. It's a very large subject, but uh, if you have any questions, we are delighted to answer those. Sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if any of the panelists see an opportunity for decryptation technology to address some of the I, I, I think so. I mean, it's one of, I think, the simplest um, aspect of cybersecurity is the user interface. And so, you know, if we, when we make it difficult, they're, it all, it all, all falls apart. So I think, you know, one of the things that we have learned from games uh, certainly is user interface and um, the ability to engage, uh, certainly, and it, and it transfers to healthcare and a lot of other things. I think in security, we have a great opportunity um, to, to look at that and understand, you know, what, are, what is the user interface? What is it that the individual wants to do? And how can we make that seamless so that they, they play by the rules? so to speak. And, and just on the gamers, I mean, they themselves are a, are a huge value and an asset because they're in, a, they're in a position to be able to quickly understand how to manage and at the same time educate others. And so through the gaming and the gamers themselves, I think that in itself presents a huge opportunity. But again, nobody's focused on that. So that, that really is the problem is who's focused on really thinking through you know, how do we take some shortcuts here, smart ones, so that we're, you know, uh, getting ahead of the hackers? Because the hackers are three, four, five steps ahead of us, or of law enforcement. Now, part of it, too, is, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Carlos, is, is, um, is to compartmentalize. We look at, a lot of the companies look at uh, who has access to what, um, and putting layers in place, um, or creating a need to know. And so that really limits, and again, lowers the probability of who can have access. So unlike, well, it's like the government, who's, who needs access to top secret, the classified. So those layers in place provide a, a significant protection that a lot of companies ignore. Yeah. Sir? Is there an increasing uh, institutionalization of all the hackers themselves? What's going on with the hackers? On that side of the equation, what, what should be expectations for what hackers are going to be doing uh, in the coming years? So there are, uh, yeah, I think there's um, several things. There are bad actor hackers that will always exist. Um, but one of the things I think that is happening certainly from the elementary school on and that we're seeing and we're promoting in the region as well is by making it sort of a positive thing, teaching hacking as a positive thing uh, from a defensive perspective. So we, you're developing a generation of, of students that are you know, my son hacked my hearing aids recently, um, but you know that, that act, you know that are seeing that there is another way to solve real problems. Now, you know that, and um, there are games, there are competitions, there are a lot of organizations out there that are making this fun, and there are companies uh, that are out there like Google and Microsoft, which you know are actively trying to recruit or pay bounties to these folks to find their flaws in their products. You know, I, I don't know that I agree with paying bounties, but I think that there is, you know, there's an approach out there that's saying, let's think a little bit differently about including the hackers. You've got Google probably hires the most, you know, most ethical hackers out there that you can think of, or you go to the Black Hat conference, 
I think it's more white hat now than, than anything, because it is institutionalized. And when you have NSA showing up and saying, we want to hire you guys, I think the game is pretty much you know, established yeah. at that point. I think one, one of the issues on, on hackers now is that it's so easy to hack because the technology has advanced so much. When I started my career, you need a room full of computers, this room entirely, to just hack a, 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 a crypto. Whether now my son also studies in a university in Switzerland and they just put 35 uh, P uh, PlayStations together in serial and with that they crack uh, SSL certificate. So, so it's so easy in our days to hack. And, and I think hacking is an intellectual challenge because it's always this kind of, uh, I'm going to be smarter than the other guy sitting. I think education is key. You mentioned about education. We need to educate young kids that hacking or learning how to hack is not an issue, but stealing data is a crime. And, and entering into corporations and do damage is a crime. And, and this line is not clear in the education that we do to engineers around the world. Any, any other question? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, maybe uh, as I was uh, in the United Nations for 15 years, I'll just give you uh, an answer from my side and after Mario complete. The, the World Wide Web, which sits on the top of the internet, which sits on the top of ARPANET, w was not designed to be geopolitical. So it's impossible. I mean, we're connecting computers among themselves. The computers doesn't know if they're in America, in China, or Russia. So the internet do not have a geopolitical connotation. The internet was designed to be global, interconnected, and very easy to access. But the internet has become an infrastructure now. The internet, we are entering into the second 25th years of the internet, which has announced last, this year actually is the 25th anniversary. The next 25 years, the internet is going to be transactional. It means we're going to be able to do payments, accessing our medical records, accessing global security issues through the internet. So once it becomes transactional, it becomes an infrastructure. This is like water, electricity, roads, and governments of the world they want to have a control on that. And this is normal. But there is a confusion on the control of the internet. The internet cannot be controlled. What can be managed at the internet is the identity space. For instance, Americans' identities will be stored in the United States, French identities in France, and so on. And that is a consolidation process where if you give that to the government, they are willing to start to work with you. China now is very clear. Non-American companies are operational in China. No cybersecurity company sells in China. Facebook is not authorized in China. Google is not authorized in China. Why? Because they collect data from Chinese. They collect data and they store in, in US servers, and they feel very strongly on that. Maybe Mario. I agree with that. I mean, the, the collection of data is paramount. Um, and I recently advised a company where they were being, they were receiving about 10 million hits daily coming into their network of, uh, of attempted hacks. And what they found out was they only needed to worry about 160 of them. And from the 160, only 25 were really critical that needed to be triaged and managed. So it's, it's the access point uh, yeah. of the internet. And we collectively should be encouraging an open internet. Yeah. And we want commerce to flow as much as possible. But at the same time, companies, individuals, and governments do need to formulate the policies that have been called for to allow for manageable access and, re and responsible access yeah. uh, so that we collectively are able to conduct our business, whether it's personal, whether it's uh, corporate, but we need to be able to communicate on an open platform. And to be honest, the, the internet is kind of obsolete concept now. Facebook has more data than the internet has on personal data on people, and, and Facebook is a platform now. It's an internet of themselves. And this is going to be the future. It's going to be many platforms, and they're going to be competing among themselves, and the best one will win. Um, so any further questions, uh, sir? Very difficult because if you really remember in the 80s, we have what you call X25 connections, which is American Express, controls the infrastructure. The only way to be secure is if you control the infrastructure. If you don't control the infrastructure, you cannot be secure. So the only thing that you can do to, co to make the internet secure is to invest heavily in cybersecurity. Encryption is the only way. You know, Snowden said in a, in a TED conference that the only way to have protected him to steal the data is by that data being encrypted. If we encrypt data, we can still use the internet without the risk of losing that data. So I think we are time out. One more question, please, sir. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. American policy right now is to make 
make ICON, which is the entity that gives the internet uh, URLs and stuff, turn that over to some kind of international. Isn't that an incredibly stupid idea, considering yeah. uh, the bad actors who will then have uh, in, uh, influence on, on that? Yeah, it's a totally stupid idea. I fully agree with you. <laughs> Because yeah. I can, I can only regulate the domain names. It doesn't regulate the internet. So I can. The only thing does is the extension, and they are not exclusive on that. National registers have their own extension capability. The problem with uh, I can is like any uh, big organization, they want to go to the next level. Actually, I can, I can wants to come into Geneva now to open offices in Geneva by telling the world, and they're going to be ruling that as ITU does for G, G, uh, G, uh, G4, G3. Uh, telephony standards. I don't think the internet can be regulated that way. As, as I say, the internet is an infrastructure. The internet can only be regulated between countries building their own infrastructure. Companies like General Electric are now the, developing what they call the industrial internet. Maybe there is the channel there because those companies are going to invest massive amount of money to make the internet of things secure. And if you make the internet of things secure, the internet of people will benefit from. So at the end of the day, it will be best practices. Countries will get together as we do in other industries because each of us have developed great practices without the need to have a super organization ruling the internet. I don't think personally, I've been working in the UN many years, and the UN will never do it. And I don't think I can. We'll never do it. But anyway, I don't know if you have. A, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's much like the ocean. Yeah. I mean, you can't. You know, it's, everybody wants to control it, but nobody well, really are. does, yeah. and nobody can regulate it. There is a good, good organization, which I think is a standard. Is IATA. IATA. We have every day hundreds of thousands of planes taking off and landing around the world, and airports around the world are able to control that complexity. Uh, there is an international standard organization which does not control the airline industry but regulates something maybe around the IATA model could make sense without the need to control. So thank you very much for, for your questions. Uh, thank you for the panelists. Give a hand to each of them for the great work here. <laughs>